Hello and welcome to Life Lessons with Biblical Answers. My name is Robbie Harmon and today we're going to be looking into Acts chapter 3 for our Bible study series. also wanted to let you know that this video is just one of a number of uh, sermons, video shorts, and short lessons that we have on the channel here to help encourage and prepare you for your daily journey with Jesus Christ. Our mission here is to provide a free service to you and to anyone who has questions about God's Word and Jesus Christ. And we invite you to be part of that mission as well. If you would, just feel free to uh, like, share, and subscribe to our channel here. Feel free to like and share this video with your friends and your family, and also with your social media and on at your congregation as well. Don't forget to subscribe to that channel and click that bell because the bell will go ahead and give you all the latest updates we have available on our channel. Finally, if you would like to ask a question, if you would like to share a prayer request, anything you'd like, or if you'd like to find a congregation that's close to you in your neck of the woods, just feel free to write to me at Brother Robbie uh, at Facebook, which is going to be facebook.com slash Brother Robbie, all one word. That's facebook.com slash Brother Robbie. I enjoy hearing from you, and I take it as a challenge to get in there and try to help and encourage as many people as I can, and I hope you take that journey very seriously as well. Let's get into the scripture today. Let's really dig in and look at where our lesson is today. We're going to be studying in Acts chapter 3, as I said, Acts chapter 3. And in today's lesson, we are going to be looking specifically at this lame beggar that is uh, coming up, to, uh, that is at the gate, beautiful, that Peter and John are going to be coming up in contact with. And I really want us to look at how important this is because in this message, in this series of events that take place, we have the foundations of the apostles' ministry. And we want to be able to follow them and see what they did to be able to encourage others to follow Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and let's just read the first ten verses here. Just the first ten verses of, of uh, chapter 3. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a lame man from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask for alms of those entering into the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze, as did John, and said, Look at us. Looking right in his eyes and said, Look at us. As he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them, Peter said, I have no gold or no silver, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and angles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who had been sitting at the, temp at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. All right, so as we begin this third chapter, we read that Peter and John are going up to the temple court at one of the hours of prayer. Now, three times a day there were calls to prayer. There was one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and one in the evening. This is the afternoon prayer session. This is right at about 3 p.m. on uh, our standard clocks today. So it would be about the third hour, or ninth hour, what we would call the third hour of the day, I guess, uh, what they would call the ninth hour because they're going from sunrise to sunset. So uh, right at the uh, ninth hour of the day, about 3 o'clock our time. And Peter and John's way into the temple there, they go through the beautiful gate and they come across this beggar who is lame from birth. He has been this way since the day he was born. And he wasn't a person that refused to work. He wasn't a person that didn't have opportunity. He was a, he was, there was a man that had absolutely nothing going for him. And I think that's something we need to look at today. A lot of people think, 
when they hear the word beggar, they, they think of somebody that, that can do something about it, that can get up and go. The truth of the matter is this. He's not a panhandler. He's not somebody that can do anything. This is a man who has been unable it, it, to do anything since the day he was born because he couldn't walk. And in those days, the welfare system that we look at today and uh, the Americas, uh, those situa that situation we have where we have uh, disability and all that to go in and take care of people that are in a situation like that, that didn't exist. So we have this man, this poor man that has nothing going for him. His family's only means of being able to take care of him is to put him out in front of the temple and, and ask for people to take care of him. And that is something that is an Old Testament covenant between people. That was one of the things they took very seriously. You see, the scriptures commanded the Israelites to help such people that were in that circumstance. In uh, Deuteronomy 15, 7 through 8, we read this. If there is a poor person among you, one of your brothers within any, your, within any of the gates in your land, the Lord your God is giving you, you must not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards your, brother, your poor brother. Instead, you are to open your hand to him and freely loan him enough for whatever he has need for. So the people of Israel went and helped people that were in those circumstances. And this was something that needed to be done. Every seven years, the debts that existed would be canceled. If these poor men had debts, they would be wiped out. But here it is. Every day, this lame man is begging for help at the temple complex. He is coming there. There is no one in there that is loaning him any money. It is just him going and begging for money to be able to take care of himself and his needs. So the lame man sees Peter and John, and, and they're coming in through the gate beautiful. And this lame man just holds his hand out. He's asking for money. And Peter and John look at him very, very intently. He looks at them and he says, and, and he, it's just like he's looking right at them. He's hoping that these men will have just some kind of mercy on him. And Peter, Peter and John both yoke down and gaze right at this man and says, look at us. Peter says, look at us. Now, this would have been a good sign to the lame man. That means that if somebody's making eye contact, that means somebody's going to get some, give something to them. You see, in our society today, we know what that's like. We see people that are on the side of the, on the sidewalk or over at the corner of a stoplight trying to ask for money and beg for money. What is the first reaction we have as people? Now, that's not to say we're bad people, but it's generally a reaction. It's a very visceral reaction. When we see someone that's in that situation, we look away real quick. We get our focus back on where we are, on a stoplight, on the crosswalk, on anything that does not involve that person because that person is in need. And we don't want to make eye contact because the minute we make eye contact, we're going to go and it's going to pull them toward us. Now, that's not something that's a negative thing. It is something that is innately human. It's something we have inside of us. It is just a part of our hardwired sinful selves. We tend to look away. Now, when Peter and John came up, they looked right at this man, square eye to eye with him, and said, look at us. This meant to that man that something big was going to happen, that they were going to give him something very important and something very neat and very much that he could use. Well, what must have gone through his mind when Peter said, well, I don't have, I have neither silver nor gold, but I have something to give you. What do you think he thought about? What? How in the world? You ain't got nothing of any value, but you're going to give me something? He must have thought they were crazy. He must have thought they were doing something that... They were dis he was disappointed. He was probably disappointed. And you can imagine that disappointment being set in as he didn't receive any money. He wasn't going to receive any money. But the words that come out of Peter's mouth are so much better than any gold, any silver could be. Peter and John were not going to go and just say, we're done here. 
he said, Peter says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Get up and walk. Now imagine that scene for a moment. <laughs> you know, this guy's thinking y'all are nuts just looking at me and want not wanting to give me any money. Now he's telling them to get up and walk. Here's a man that has not walked since the day he was born, that did not have any walking, any ability whatsoever, wasn't able to get around unless his family packed him, but yet here he is, and he's being told, rise up and walk. Yeah, right, I can see that happening. If you carefully read the text, it does not say that the lame man simply got up and was healed. Notice that Peter pulls him up to his feet, grabs him by his right hand and pulls him up. And once Peter pulls the lame man to his feet, the scriptures go and tell us that the lame man's feet and ankles became strong. They became strong. He became physically able to support his weight, not just be able to uh, kind of ease around a little bit. No, this was immediate. This was physical impossible. This was physically impossible except through Jesus Christ. He got up, his legs filled out, he gained strength in them, and he was able to walk. He had every right to cause a commotion because he had gotten up, not just walking, he was walking, jumping, leaping, and praising God. So he had every right in the world to be able to look at and be seen. Everybody was turning their attention to him. All the people in the temple complex saw this man. They were seeing him walking and jumping and praising God. And then those very same people began to realize who that person was. They started asking themselves, what? Isn't that the same guy we see at the gate beautiful all the time? Isn't that the same guy that was over there that his family's brought him in all these years? We've kept giving him money. We've kept taking care of him. Is that the same guy? And everybody's saying, yes, they were shocked. This man is the very one who is walking and leaping around the courtyard. Therefore, in verse 10, it goes and says, So they were filled with awe and astonishment at what had happened to him. So all the people were amazed. They all got up. They all ran toward Peter and John and this lame man who is miraculously walking now. And they go and they start asking questions. This is going to provide Peter and John an audience and an opportunity to preach about Jesus Christ. As we look at Peter's sermon, I want us to notice that Peter makes the same points as he did in Acts chapter 2 after the miracle of the Holy Spirit come down to the apostles. Let's look at the next few verses here. Let's go down here and look at the sermon from 11 all the way to the end on 26 here. It says, while he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? And why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abram, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you, just, you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. The faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of all of you. Now, brothers, I know that you have acted in ignorance as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom of 
of his holy prophets long ago, Moses said, The Lord will raise up you to for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him proclaim these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant of God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, In your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. See that? He raised every he raised up his servant and offers them the opportunity to come to know this savior, this Jesus who has died for them. Now let's have us look here for just a moment. I want to talk about the source of Peter and John's power. The very first point that they make out here is that the people are seeing these things that are not being done through their own abilities. It's not through John. It's not through Peter. It is through something greater. The people are looking at Peter and John in astonishment, wondering how they were able to perform such a great miracle. Peter and John tells the people that the miracle didn't happen from their own godliness, from their own abilities. Verse 13 says that God has glorified his servant Jesus, that this miracle was to glorify Jesus and show his power. The rest of verse 13 through verse 15 is a parenthetical point that we'll consider in just a moment. Verse 16 picks up that this point, at this point, that the power is in Jesus. You see, by faith in his name, his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. So the faith that comes through him has given him this perfect health in front of you all. You see, Peter wants the people to know that the power doesn't come from them, doesn't come from anything special that they did. It only comes through the name of Jesus Christ, the perfect name of Jesus Christ, that all authority is done through him. This miracle was not the work of men, nor was the miracle the work of God glorifying the lame man himself. It was a miracle that was done as the working of God glorifying the Son, Jesus Christ, to show them the power that exists in the authority of Jesus. Now, Peter and John must show that the power is in Jesus for them to be convicted of their sins of killing Jesus, okay? By showing them that Jesus is God. Now Peter go and John go and point the finger back to the people for crucifying Jesus. They go right back in and say that they were the ones that handed Christ over to Pilate. The people are the ones who denied Jesus in the presence of Pilate. They were the ones that said, no, we don't want him. We don't, have, we don't see him as a king. Behold, Pilate said, behold, your king. And the people responded, we have no king but Caesar. Peter goes further and reminds them that instead of the holy and righteous one, they released a known murderer, Barabbas, instead of Christ Jesus. The people made the choice when they could have freed him. Again, Peter says that the people killed the source of life as we remember the people shouting so strongly, crucify him, crucify him, in that riot that was forming. And to show the greatness of God's glory it is found in Jesus Christ. Peter then goes and preaches that this Jesus God raised up from the dead and did the apostles that John himself and all the other of the, of the 12 were to be witnesses of that resurrection. They were hands-on experiencers of that situation that came up when Jesus appeared to them. He appeared to them first. And they were the ones that responded and were witnesses, eyewitnesses to the fact that Jesus Christ was not dead, but resurrected and that God did that through his working and his power. So Peter made that very point. 
Peter does not make a direct quotation at this point, but tells the multitudes in the temple complex that these things had been spoken by all of God's prophets. He didn't do what he did with Joel. He didn't go and say, well, I'm going to go and quote this to you and tell you what this is. But he'll relay later, he will return to the point when two other things were to take place when the Messiah came that was predicted by God's prophets. You see, Peter decided it, was, it is enough at this point, though, to remind the people that God's prophets were the ones that spoke of Messiah's suffering. You can go back and look at Isaiah chapter 53 in particular, where uh, when Isaiah talks about the suffering servant and show how much suffering Jesus would go through, how this one man would go and have the world put on his shoulders. Now, since they are the ones that, that crucified the Savior and got Son of God, these people are going to be the ones that have to be able to change based upon their actions. They need to do something. And so in verse 19, Peter says, Therefore, repent. Peter says, It is time to turn back to God. I have always found it interesting that Peter says repent and turn back. You know, we often define repentance as turning back. And if that is the case, then Peter is being redundant here. Turn back and turn back. It's more than that, though. Repentance has to do with the change of mind, will, and focus and its purpose. It was time for the people to change their focus and their purpose to live back for God. The turning back is the action backing up the mental change. It is not just saying that I'm mentally going to do it. I am mentally and physically and everything, mind, spirit, body, and soul, all of it is going to change. It is all going to be different. Now, I know that some of you guys might have more questions about repentance. If you do, we have a short video on here, which I'm going to be uplinking up here at the top. Uh, you'll see a little eye come across there. Click on that, and you'll learn more about repentance and what repentance is according to Scripture. I encourage you to watch that and learn from it because that is so important today. So many times we go and we talk about believing, we talk about baptizing, we talk about confessing, but we never say a word about repenting. So we need to be focused in on what Peter is saying here. It is time to repent and turn back to God. Another way to understand Peter's language is to repent and flee to God. Not flee from him, but flee to him. We are to move ourselves closer to God as God has commanded. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. This is necessary in salvation. It is absolutely essential. And Peter has already preached repentance in Acts chapter 2 to another audience. And here in Acts 3, he's doing the exact same thing, talking of the necessity of it. This is how our sins will be wiped out, by changing our focus to serve and to live for God. The image that Peter uses here is a beautiful one where our sins are described as being wiped away, wiped completely away. In Acts chapter 2, Peter describes God passing forgiveness upon our sins. And in Acts 3, he describes God wiping our slate clean, completely clean of our sins. Our past is completely wiped clean when we come to God in repentance. And also, if you recall in Acts chapter 2, Peter says to the multitudes that there was more to be received than just the forgiveness of sins. He also says you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 3, Peter does not simply tell the people that they can have their sins wiped. Oh no, he goes in deeper and he says that your sins may be wiped out so that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and he may send Jesus who has been appointed Messiah to you. Heaven must welcome him until the time of the restoration of all things, which God spoke about by the mouth of his holy prophets from the beginning. From the beginning, he says. There's a whole lot to be said that is taking place here in this section of Scripture. But the Scripture is the best commentary upon itself, and we are going to consider the context of Peter's words here to get a handle on what he's saying in Acts 3, 19 through 21. 
I want us to look at that. That first key is in verse 21 where Peter says that these things have been spoken about by God's holy prophets from the beginning. Now Peter proves this by going and quoting Moses in uh, verse 22 and 23. Did Moses ever prophesy about the second coming of Christ? Well, did he? Did he prophesy that Jesus was coming back? Well, many people understand Peter to be preaching that God's people need to repent because Jesus will not return a second time until the restoration of all things take place. Of course, they will argue that the restoration of all things is the restoration of the nation of Israel and the establishment of God's kingdom in Jerusalem. But that's not what he's saying here. You see, God's government is not a premillennial end times theory. Okay, It is something that's living, breathing, and active. It's the church. The prophets never spoke of the second coming of Christ. Moses certainly did not, and Peter does not use any quotation concerning Moses to say anything about the coming second, the second coming. Instead, he goes and he looks, look at the second verse here, and look at what the second verse in verse 24 says, where Peter says that all the prophets had spoken of these things. Every single word God's prophets spoke in those days, or about seasons of refreshing would come, and the times of restoration would take place. You see, we have to ask ourselves a very important question. A very important one. What common theme did all the prophets speak of? What common theme did all the prophets speak of when it came to this specific prophecy of the times of refreshing? Peter says that all the prophets, even from the beginning, spoke of these things. Whatever they were speaking about in the answer to what Peter means is, is the answer to what Peter means in verses 19 through 21. All of the prophets spoke not of a second coming, but of the first coming of the Messiah. The very first coming of the Messiah where the kingdom would be set up. The, king, the kingdom of God would be set up with the Messiah and his establishment. With the Messiah, first time, not second time, first time coming. All the prophets spoke of the blessing that would come to those in God's kingdom when the Messiah came. All of the prophets spoke of the judgment that would come upon the disobedient when the Messiah came. This is what Peter is quoting in Acts 3, 22 and 23. Moses said that God would raise up a prophet like him from among the people. The one would be the Messiah, God's Redeemer, the Christ. The people had to listen to what he said, and if they didn't, those people would be completely cut off from the kingdom of God. So what is Peter saying in Acts 3, 19 through 21? The very same thing he said in Acts 2. The Messiah has to come, and all the prophets said he would come. Every one of them said it. The prophets told us that he came there, he came there uh, and that there was going to be a great blessing poured out on all the people who were his, and there was going to be great destruction and judgment upon those that did not obey. He, it was at this time, it was at this point, for the people to be restored to God at this moment. After they seen who the Messiah was. This would be the restoration or establishment of the kingdom of the Messiah. The people had previously violated the covenant with God and had been cut off. Now the Messiah had come and these were the times for the people to be restored to God. Remember back in Acts chapter 1 verse 6? Remember what he said when he says, Lord, at this time are you restoring the kingdom of Israel? Remember when that question was asked? Now the restoration of Israel was taking place. This was the seasons of God's blessing and it was, re God, it was now time returning and being restored to God or experience the judgments thereof. Key in verse 23 again, and it will be that everyone who will not listen to the prophet will be completely destroyed from among the people. 
You see, Peter is preaching the same judgment to the audience as he did in Acts chapter 2. The very same judgment. Remember when we saw in Acts chapter 2 that Peter spoke about the blessings that would come upon all flesh? As Joel prophesied, Peter ends the promise of blessings upon God's people again. In verse 25 he says, You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your forefathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth will be blessed. God raised up his servant and sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your evil ways. This is a description of the great blessings that the, king, that the king has poured out upon them, that God the Father has done. They are children of the prophets, first off. The prophets were chosen by God to deliver a message. The people would obey and seek him are the ones that would be chosen by God. They were given a covenant that God fulfilled. God's promise to them was that Abraham's seed, in Abraham's seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. When we read of God's promises, this is the great one that the people of Israel were looking for, for the fulfillment that all nations would be blessed by the seed of God and by the seed of Abraham. I believe that this statement describes the promise that was made in Acts 2 where Peter told them, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you to your children and for all those who are far off as many as the Lord our God will call. That's in Acts 2, 38 and 39. What promise was given to the people of Israel and to people far off that had not been fulfilled yet? I submit to you that the promise in Acts 3.25 would be that foundation. All the nations of the earth would be blessed. And that promise has now been fulfilled and the people of Israel were the first to experience this great blessing as, as verse 26 points out. Now, this was the time of the prophets were pointing to. Peter reminds them that the Messiah was going to bring two things. First, he was going to bring the blessings of God to those who obeyed and judgment to those that did not obey. Just as, J just as Moses had pointed out, Peter is telling the people that it is not only about having their sins wiped out. It is not only about having those sins blotted out, wiped clean because of what they have done. It is the fulfillment of God's promise that the Messiah has come through their people and first to the people offering God's hand of blessing, fellowship, restoration, and partakers in the kingdom of God. God had established his kingdom and those in the audience as well as those who were hearing the message from far off can become sons of God, heirs of God, fellow partakers in the blessing that God bestows to his children. We are joint heirs with Jesus. That means we are in standing of high blessing and regard. God looks at us just as he does his own son. I think that's something that we do take for granted. I think we take it for granted that we can look at God and call him our father. I think that's one of the biggest problems in our society today. We take those words for granted, our father who art in heaven, thou hallowed be thy name. We look at that and just say, well, that's people praying. If you go back and look in the Old Testament, you won't see very often, if at all, the word father used to describe God. You see, God is considered the creator, the one, the I am. There is no way we could have a relationship that close from what the people were thinking at that point. But it was when Jesus came that said, Look, I don't want you to have a relationship with me that is distant. I want you to have a relationship with me that is intimate that is close, that connects, is why Jesus told them in Matthew chapter 6, Pray as I do, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
That means you've got the opportunity and privilege to pray to God by calling Him your Father. Here, in the words of the Hebrew, the words of the Roman, or the Greek Hebrew, the Greek meaning of that word, meaning Daddy. That's the closeness we have with our Lord. When we say Abba Father, when we say those words Abba Father, it means Daddy. That's the kind of connection we have with God. That is the kind of connection we need to have with God. That is the kind of connection we should treasure with God. Because we have been given access through Jesus Christ to call Him Daddy. To call Him Father. Our closest possible connection. That family connection. That is something we need to preserve now more than ever. And it's something we need to be living for now more than ever. How would you like to have your sins wiped out today? How would you like to have all the barriers blown away? To have everything, every obstacle blown out of the way so that you connect, can connect with your Father? How would you like to call the Almighty One who created all things your Father today? Would you like God to be with you on your day-to-day -day living and give you hope, strength, and encouragement? God has set His kingdom up and it is time for us to be citizens of that kingdom. It is our heavenly calling and we should be willing to answer Him. To have these things, we must do as Moses said, to listen to Jesus and do as He says. If we do not listen, then we will be cut off from the people of God and destroyed. Come to God today. Repent. Change your focus and submit to the will of God. Come back to the Father and be baptized. Only then will you be able to call yourself a child of God. Not because I say it, not because the church says it, but because Jesus says it that we can be children of the kingdom and have true life now and throughout eternity in heaven. That's the promise we have in Jesus Christ. And I encourage you to be seeking His face today. If you have questions about how to become a part of the family of God, feel free to write me, as I said, on Facebook, you can go over to facebook.com slash brother Robbie, all one word there. Uh, just feel free to come and visit me. You can send me a message. Ask me what the plan of salvation is. And I'll be glad to share it with you. And I'll be able to get you connected up with someone who may be close in your neighborhood that may be able to speak to you about the kingdom. Maybe you just want to be able to rededicate yourself to walking with him. Maybe you heard something today that spurred you, challenged you, and made you realize that you need to have Jesus in your life. I'll pray, that, I'll pray for you this day and ask that God be an encouragement in your life and that you seek His face and rededicate yourself to walking with Him today. You don't have to make a big stand for it, but what you need to do is change your life publicly, personally, privately, in every possible way. Reconnect with God. Or maybe you just need some prayer. By all means, reach out to me. I'd be glad to pray with you. We are called to encourage and help one another. We can do that today, but we just got to be willing to ask for the help. Do you need that help today? I encourage you and I ask you, weigh that decision in your heart today. Don't hold back. Give it to God whether the burden is knowing Him for the first time, coming back to knowing Him, or if you just need some prayer. We are here for you. May God bless you and keep you this week. We look forward to seeing you next time on our Life Lessons page. Until then, God bless you and keep you in your journey.